Well, good morning. It is my delight to be here with you among friends at Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, besides Dr. Thomas, I have so many friends uh, who are part of the faculty and administration here, and even more friends who are OBU alums from over the years. Uh, this is a special place, and I count it a great privilege to be here today and to be able to deliver this lecture. I bring you greetings from Union University. We are a sister Baptist university in the state of Tennessee, uh, and in many, many ways, the most important ways, a very like-minded institution with OBU. And so being here uh, among you feels like being with family. I've titled this lecture today, After the Controversy Towards the Renewal of Southern Baptist Identity. Baptists talk a lot about their identity. Church historian William Estep once argued that the Southern Baptist historical experience can best be understood as a search for identity. I agree, though I would add that this phenomenon isn't limited just to Southern Baptists. The wider Baptist tradition has been questing for identity ever since the earliest Baptist churches were established in the 17th century in places such as Amsterdam, London, and Providence, Rhode Island. Early Baptists wrote confessions of faith to distinguish their beliefs from the movements around them, such as the Church of England, the Separatist Puritans, and the Mennonites. They drafted church covenants that identified their congregations as free communities of disciples rather than parishes of the established church. And they wrote treatises about their identity, often distilling their beliefs into sets of so-called Baptist distinctives or Baptist principles. OBU's own Stan Norman has studied these writings extensively, arguing that they represent a form of confessional theology among Baptists. These treatises were often polemical, often written in the midst of controversy. As you will know, or as many of you will know, Southern Baptists were embroiled in a significant controversy during the final two decades of the 20th century. It has been called a conservative resurgence, a Baptist reformation, a fundamentalist takeover, a Southern Baptist holy war, a new crusade for a new holy land, and an inerrancy controversy. Many Baptists simply call it the controversy. Now, I won't rehash the history of the controversy in this lecture. For the sake of time, I'll simply remind you that the result was a decisively rightward shift in our Southern Baptist institutions as self-confessed conservatives wrested leadership from self-proclaimed moderates. The controversy was allegedly about a lot of things depending upon your perspective a conservative desire for theological renovation, moderate institutional and vocational self-preservation, a desire to either gain or keep power depending upon where you were coming from, a clash of larger-than-life Baptist personalities. And all of this is true to varying degrees, but like most Baptist battles, the controversy was ultimately a debate about Baptist identity. Southern Baptists now find ourselves more than a decade and a half removed from the controversy. Despite shared commitments to biblical inerrancy, basic Baptist distinctives and evangelism and mission, we remain in many ways uncertain of our identity. We aren't drifting toward left-wing theology and ethics, which was a valid concern a generation ago, but we aren't ent entirely sure who we are either. Are we evangelicals? Are we part of the reform tradition? Are we heirs of the radical reformation? Are we too Southern to be a truly national denomination? Are denominations even relevant in a so-called post-denominational age? Descriptively speaking, there are many ways to be Baptist, even within the Southern Baptist Convention, but prescriptively, who ought we to be on this side of the controversy? In this lecture, my goal is not to provide an exposition of Baptist distinctives. 
If you're interested in that, I would commend to you Dr. Norman's The Baptist Way as the best recent treatment of that topic. For my part, I want to step back and offer a paradigm for how to think about the nature of Baptist identity itself. I argue that the Baptist tradition is at its best when it envisions our identity as simultaneously Catholic, Reformational, Restorationist, and Evangelical. When these four themes are embraced as overlapping layers of Baptist identity, they provide a constructive framework within which we can discuss the full range of our beliefs and emphases, including our Baptist distinctives. I believe this thick approach to Baptist identity, filtered through the particular experiences of Southern Baptist history, is a key component in the ongoing renewal of our theology, mission, and spirituality on this side of the controversy. So number one, Baptist Catholicity. Have you heard the old joke about the Pope who died and went to heaven? Jesus was giving him a tour of the many rooms in the Father's house that had been prepared for his children. The Pope looked into the Catholic room and he saw they were celebrating another Notre Dame Bowl victory. He looked into the Presbyterian room and he saw that they were celebrating a Princeton Lacrosse National Championship. He looked into the Methodist room and he saw them celebrating a Duke basketball win in the Final Four. But when he came to the Baptist room, he could hear them celebrating the OBU Bison Baseball National Championship inside. But the door was locked. The Pope asked Jesus why the door was locked, and he replied that the Baptists always kept the door locked because they liked to pretend they were the only ones in heaven. <laughs> Baptists have often had a sectarian streak. And even when we haven't, other traditions have accused us of being sectarians. From time to time, we have to be reminded that we are but one part of God's kingdom. Our Baptist identity is necessarily derivative of our Christian identity. It's a variation on a theme. As the historian Tom Nettles has well said, Baptists are orthodox. That is to say, one must be a Christian before he can be a Baptist. We're part of what David Dockery and Timothy George call the great tradition, what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity, what Richard Baxter called Catholic Christianity. The antidote to Baptist sectarianism, both real and perceived, is a deeper sense of Baptist Catholicity. Now to be clear, by the word Catholic, I don't mean Roman Catholic, but rather I mean Catholic in the older sense of that term, universal or whole. This is the same sense in which the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed confess our faith in the Holy Catholic Church. These symbols predate the conflation of Western Christendom with Roman Catholicism by several centuries. In the fifth century, the theologian Vincent of Lorraine famously argued that the word Catholic fundamentally means that which has been believed everywhere, by all, always. Simply put, to be a Baptist is to be a particular type of Christian, and to be any type of Christian means that one embraces particular convictions that characterize the Christian faith as it's been historically understood. With all Christians, Baptists believe in the triune God who exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We believe that this triune God created the world good, but that his world has been corrupted because of the sin of the first human beings. We believe that Jesus Christ is the unique God-man, the incarnate Son of God, fully God and fully human. We believe that God is redeeming the world and rescuing lost sinners through the person and work of Jesus Christ. We believe that every human being will spend eternity either in heaven or hell, and that one's eternal destination is based upon whether or not he or she embraces or rejects the, the Christian faith. We believe that all these truths are taught in the Bible, which is God's written word to humanity. Every one of those convictions 
is more central to the Christian faith than our Baptist distinctives. In fact, when we make much about Baptist principles without clearly rooting them in these Catholic convictions, we risk actually becoming the very sectarians that our friends and other traditions so often accuse us of being. Progressive Baptist theologians such as Steve Harmon and Curtis Freeman have offered creative proposals for Baptist Catholicity that include a number of ideas, such as more explicit affirmation of the ancient church's creedal consensus, liturgical renewal, a more sacramental understanding of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and a greater openness to ecumenism. They've started an important conversation. I believe a key facet of Southern Baptist identity after the controversy includes engaging the sorts of issues that they're raising, but from a perspective that is more consistently conservative and evangelical, yet one that is also, like them, firmly committed to a more robust sense of Baptist Catholicity than has often been the norm in our tradition. I'm excited to be a part of a group of Southern Baptist scholars that is committed to this very project. OBU's own Matt Emerson has been a key leader in pulling us together for this purpose. Number two, Baptist identity and reformational emphases. Next year, Christians around the world will celebrate the 500th anniversary of the symbolic beginning of the Protestant Reformation. On October 31st, 1517, after he had finished trick-or-treating, an, an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther drafted a list of 95 theses that challenged alleged errors and abuses promulgated within the late medieval Catholic Church. Tradition has it Luther nailed his 95 theses to the front door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, provoking the controversy that resulted in the various European reformations. Within a generation, the Lutheran and Reformed churches had established themselves as separate Christian traditions apart from the Catholic Church, and the Church of England had renounced its ties to Rome. These traditions remain intact to the present day, as well as the countless sub-movements within them and the offshoots that have left them. While Baptists hold many Catholic beliefs that are shared across the great tradition of Christian orthodoxy, we are part of the Protestant branch of the Christian family tree. Now, we've not always admitted that we're Protestants, and sometimes we've denied it outright. 19th century landmarkers claim that Baptist churches are true New Testament churches, full stop, and that there have always been Baptist churches from the day of Pentecost until today. They argued that Baptists aren't Protestants because Protestants left the Roman Catholic Church. Baptists, the true New Testament churches, were never part of the Church of Rome in the first place. More recently, during World War II, many Southern Baptist pastors protested that draftees had to identify on their draft cards as either Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. They argued that Baptists were a third Christian tradition that was older than the Protestants and the Catholics, and they refused to be lumped into the same camp with the Presbyterians, Methodists, Lutherans, and Episcopals. Well, sectarian objections notwithstanding, I argue that Baptists are third-generation Protestants who came into existence as a direct result of the various reformations in continental Europe and the British Isles during the 16th century. This means that Baptists are reformational Christians who share many important theological convictions with other Protestants who are not Baptists. Like most Protestants, Baptists believe that salvation comes by grace through faith and that humans are justified by their faith in Christ alone rather than by good works. We believe in the supreme authority of Scripture arguing that the Bible is our ultimate norm for faith and practice and is of a greater authority than traditions, creeds, or human opinions. Most of us believe in only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and we reject the idea that these practices are channels of any sort of saving grace. 
In fact, most Baptists call baptism in the Lord's Supper ordinances rather than sacraments to emphasize that Christ commanded these practices and to make clear that they don't contribute to one's justification. Finally, most of us believe in a universal church that is comprised of all the redeemed of all the ages, that is visible now to varying degrees across the various Christian traditions, and that will assemble together one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb. A key component of the renewal of Southern Baptist identity is a willingness to own our convictions that are inherited from the Protestant traditions from which we sprang. To say it a different way, When Baptists talk about our understanding of Scripture and the gospel, we want to speak in a Protestant accent. The 500th anniversary of the Reformation is uh, the perfect time to recommit ourselves to the five solas of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Sola Gratia, grace alone. Sola Fide, faith alone. Sola Christus, Christ alone, and soli Deo Gloria, the glory of God alone. These reformational themes remind us that Scripture alone is our ultimate authority for what it means to be Christian and to live Christianly. And when it comes to our salvation, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Baptist distinctives matter little if we are iffy about God's Word or misunderstand a core component of our salvation. Number three, Baptist identity and ecclesial restorationism. Baptist historian Doug Weaver argues that the central theme in Baptist history is the search for the New Testament church. While I wouldn't agree that this is the central theme of Baptist history, I do think that Professor Weaver is on to something. Baptists have always applied the principle of sola scriptura to their ecclesiology and have strived as much as possible to uh, conform the patterns and practices and priorities of local churches to those of the earliest churches in the New Testament. This is a form of restorationism, which is the impulse to restore anything that has been lost or obscured between the New Testament faith and contemporary Christianity. With the exception of landmarkers and some primitive Baptists, most Baptists have been what I would call moderate restorationists. We do not reject the validity of other Christian traditions in principle, But we do object to aspects of their respective ecclesiologies based upon our reading of the New Testament. Restorationism has been an impulse throughout Christian history, but for our purposes, I'm going to begin with the Reformation era. As early as 1521, there were Christians in Zurich who rejected the medieval concepts of a territorial church and infant baptism ideas that continued to predominate in various ways in the Lutheran and Reformed traditions. These so-called Anabaptists, or rebaptizers, argued for local congregations of presumably regenerate or born-again individuals who voluntarily united together through believers' baptism. Now, many Anabaptists were heretics, but the more orthodox Anabaptists helped launch what we now call the free church tradition, which is characterized by restorationist ecclesiology and a suspicion of any arrangements wherein church and state officially reinforce each other. The late Harvard historian George Hunston Williams famously dubbed the Anabaptists and similar movements the Radical Reformation to distinguish them from the so-called magisterial reformers such as the Lutherans and Calvinists and the Church of England, each of which used the power of the state to enforce the reforms of the church. Within a half century, there were similar restorationist congregations in England. Though unlike the Anabaptists, these English churches were Calvinistic in their theology and continued to practice infant baptism. They went by names such as separatists and independents. Though they were part of the larger Puritan tradition, they constituted the left wing of Puritanism because instead of trying to reform the Church of England from within, they formed new congregations that were independent 
of any sort of Episcopal oversight. When some of these radical Puritans began to couple their restorationist ecclesiology with the practice of believers' baptism in the early 17th century, the Baptist movement was born. As Bill Hull argues, quote, while deeply indebted to the Protestant principle, Baptist identity was even more radical for it represented an effort to reform the Reformation. The Baptist movement arose not in protest against a corrupt Catholicism, but in protest against an incomplete Protestantism, end quote. In other words, Baptists are best understood as an ecclesiological renewal movement within post-Reformation Protestantism. Contemporary historians debate Baptist origins. Some argue we are spiritual heirs of the Anabaptists, while most counter that our more substantive historical roots are found in English separatism. For our purposes, I'm less concerned with the debate over historical origins and more interested in how ideas shape Baptist identity. And when it comes to ideas, there is little doubt that Baptists represent a hybrid movement that in many ways reflects themes found in both Anabaptism and English separatism, but that doesn't look exactly like either of those movements. To be more prescriptive, I contend that the early Baptists were able to combine the best of the Magisterial Reformation's commitment to the five solas with the best of the Radical Reformation's commitment to free churches. When we're at our healthiest, we continue to embrace both these reformational and restorationist themes today. Now, I said that I'm not going to talk much about Baptist distinctives, and I'm going to keep that promise. But I do want to say that it is within the context of Baptist restorationism, rooted in our Catholic and reformational identity, that we should discuss our tradition's distinctive emphases, regenerate church membership, believer-only baptism, congregational polity, local church autonomy, the priesthood of all believers, and liberty of conscience under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I think we need to be honest, and we're not always very honest about this. We can't perfectly replicate every New Testament pattern and practice. For example, nearly all Baptists agree the apostolic office has ceased which automatically means we can't fully conform to New Testament leadership practices. We also need to admit that nearly all of our churches embrace practices that aren't commanded or even commended in the New Testament, but that we nevertheless believe are consistent with principles we find in Scripture. Some examples would include things such as new member classes, church committees, church nurseries, specialized leadership positions such as student ministers and worship pastors. And yet none of these things are mandated in Scripture, and yet we all believe that these things are faithful methods that we're free to adopt even though we don't see them in the New Testament. Finally, we need to remember that our socio-political context is very different from that of the New Testament. We don't live under the threat of active government persecution, at least at the moment, and our society is far more mobile than first century Palestine. But having stated these caveats, the ongoing renewal of Southern Baptist identity means we can and should attempt to faithfully adopt and adapt New Testament ecclesiology to our contemporary context, concerns, and challenges. I'm actually fairly encouraged on this point. I believe that many of our contemporary debates about polity, baptism, and communion are often discussions about how best to conform our contemporary practices to apostolic patterns. Advocates of issues as diverse as a plurality of elders or pastors, pastor or elder-led congregationalism, multi-site churches, redemptive church discipline, so-called spontaneous mass baptisms, sacramental views of baptism, open communion, and open membership all make the claim that their views either directly reflect or are faithful adaptations of New Testament patterns and practices. Now, maybe they are and maybe they aren't. Candidly, I resonate with some of those issues, reject some others, and remain undecided about a couple of them. 
But I appreciate the fact that most of the proponents of most of these views are attempting to offer exegetical arguments for their position, even when I disagree with their exegesis. To the degree we keep our New Testaments open as we engage in these debates about Baptist church life, while also remaining humble and honest about the scriptural gray areas and places of necessary contextual tweaking, we will faithfully embody a healthy, moderate, restorationist identity. Number four, Baptist identity and evangelicalism. The mid-1970s were heady days for evangelicals. Jimmy Carter was a self-proclaimed born-again Christian who was on his way to the White House. Chuck Colson was a former political operative in the Nixon administration who spent time in prison for Watergate before coming to faith in Christ and writing a best-selling memoir titled Born Again. Polls consistently identified evangelist Billy Graham as the most respected man in America as he preached the gospel to stadiums filled with people. Pollster George Gallup Jr. recognized the cultural moment when he announced that 1976 was the year of the evangelical. Interestingly, all three of the famous evangelicals I just mentioned were Southern Baptists. Not all Southern Baptists were pleased with this evangelical label. In a 1976 cover story for Newsweek magazine, Foy Valentine of the SBC's Christian Life Commission was quoted as saying of Southern Baptists, we're not evangelicals. That's a Yankee word. They want to claim us because we are big and successful and growing every year. But we have our own traditions, our own hymns, our own identity, and more students in our seminaries than they have in all of theirs put together. We don't share their politics or their fussy fundamentalism, and we don't want to get involved in their theological witch hunts. Southern Baptists have continued to debate our relationship to evangelicalism ever since that Newsweek article. At least three entire books focus upon this topic, in addition to several standalone scholarly essays and countless blog posts. I think a strong case can be made that Baptists are a type of evangelical and that Southern Baptists should more intentionally own this aspect of our identity. Most historians date the origins of modern evangelicalism to the 18th century revivals now known as either the Evangelical Awakening in the British Isles or the First Great Awakening in the American colonies. The key early evangelical leaders were men such as George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and the Wesley brothers. Baptist historian David Bebbington has argued that the four distinguishing convictions of evangelicalism since the 18th century have been conversionism, biblicism, crucicentrism, that's a word he invented, it means cross-centeredness, and activism. That's what scholars do, we invent words just to irritate people. Scholars debate the merits of this so-called Bebbington quadrilateral, especially theologians who desire more prescription than these four convictions offer. But most historians agree that Bebbington's paradigm is a helpful descriptive account of basic evangelical belief. For Baptists, the key to our evangelicalism lies in our activism. There's little doubt that Baptists already emphasized personal conversion, a high view of Scripture, in the centrality of the atonement from our earliest days. But the advent of evangelicalism introduced a far more pronounced activism into Baptist DNA, especially, though not exclusively, a deep commitment to local evangelism and global mission. In the 1770s, Daniel Taylor adopted Wesleyan principles and introduced them into the general Baptist tradition in England. And that resulted in the thoroughly evangelical new connection of General Baptists. In the 1780s, Andrew Fuller and his circle of friends, most famously William Carey, came under the doctrinal influence of Jonathan Edwards and promoted an Edwardsian evangelical Calvinism among the British particular Baptists. These so-called Fullerites are often credited with launching the modern mission movement in the English-speaking world. 
In North America, the first great awakening of the 1740s uh, far more significantly influenced the older regular Baptist tradition than is sometimes assumed, while the separate Baptist tradition and the northern free will Baptist movement were both birthed in direct response to Whitfield's ministry in the 1770s. What all these Baptist groups shared in common, whether they were in England or America, whether they were Calvinistic or Arminian, was their commitment to an evangelical activism. Around the turn of the 19th century, the regular Baptists and the separate Baptists in the USA began to come together in a, into a single Baptist movement. They were moderately Calvinistic, mostly pro-revival, and strongly committed to evangelical activism. They started various home and foreign mission societies, established colleges and seminaries, and coalesced in state conventions that focused on regional activism. They deeply appreciated the Fullerite Baptists in England, but they also had homegrown heroes, such as Adoniram and Ann Judson, Luther Rice, John Mason Peck, Francis Wayland, and Richard Furman. Though they were evangelicals, they remained full-throated Baptists, which meant they embraced the moderately restorationist ecclesiology I discussed in the last section. In 1845, American Baptists divided when those in the South broke off to form a new Southern Baptist Convention. This sort of split was a regrettable trend among all the denominations of that era that was mostly related to regional differences over slavery. The new Southern Baptist Convention was as evangelical as the earlier movements that flowed into it, and as time went on, the SBC actually remained more consistently evangelical than its Northern Baptist counterpart because the latter was far more influenced by modernist thought as we approached the turn of the 20th century. So back to the contemporary debate about Southern Baptists and evangelicalism. It's true that Southern Baptists have always struggled with isolationist tendencies. At times this has been because of sectarian movements such as landmarkism, but even among many Southern Baptists less influenced by landmark beliefs, there's been a prideful isolationist tendency to see ourselves as bigger and better and more effective and more biblical than other types of Christians. We heard a bit of this isolationism of pride in Foy Valentine's aforementioned comments about evangelicalism, but it was an issue long before the 1970s. In 1859, Georgia Baptist pastor C.D. Mallory published a booklet calling upon Southern Baptists to repent of what he called denominational idolatry. He warned against idolatry over our denominational sentiments, Baptist distinctives, our denominational gifts, famous Baptist leaders, our denominational successes, baptisms and new church starts, and our denominational anticipations, our part in fulfilling the Great Commission. If you pay much attention to Southern Baptist life, you know each of these idolatries is more than alive and well among us, over 150 years later. Historically understood, Southern Baptists are most certainly a type of evangelical, but we must avoid two temptations if we're to experience ongoing evangelical renewal. First, we must resist all forms of sectarianism and isolationism that tempt us to look condescendingly at other evangelical traditions and go it alone in our efforts to advance the gospel. We must be evangelical Baptists. But we must also resist the tendency in a post-denominational age of ignoring or even rejecting our historic Baptist distinctives, which would definitely lead to a downgrade in our ecclesiology and would at least open the door to a downgrade in other areas of faith and practice. We must be Baptist evangelicals. In his contribution to the 1983 book, Are Southern Baptist Evangelicals?, Theologian James Leo Garrett argued Southern Baptists are evangelicals but with a strong denominational identity. I agree. Southern Baptists are what I call denominational evangelicals in that we relate to the wider evangelical movement through our denominational tradition. To be an orthodox, faithful Baptist is to be a particular type of evangelical. We don't want to discard our evangelical identity even in an age when that label has been compromised in so many ways by leftward theological drift, scandalous ethical compromises, and idolatrous political calculations. 
We want to embody the best of what it means to be evangelical while also maintaining a firm commitment to our Baptist distinctives. This sort of balance will enable Southern Baptists to remain tethered to healthy evangelical emphases on the centrality of the gospel, a high view of Scripture's inspiration, authority, and truthfulness, and faithfulness in ministries of justice and mercy, and urgency and obedience to the Great Commission to make disciples here, there, and everywhere. This sort of convictionally Southern Baptist evangelicalism will also allow us to offer to our fellow evangelicals a prophetic witness, if you will, to a view of the church that closely conforms to New Testament practices and is shaped by the gospel and its intentional application to ecclesiological matters. Conclusion. I've attempted to make the case that the renewal of Southern Baptist identity after the controversy means self-consciously conceiving of ourselves as being a people who are Catholic, Reformational, Restorationist, and Evangelical. There is a sense of historical development to my ordering. Catholicity was clarified in the patristic era, but became divided during the medieval era, necessitating the Protestant Reformations. The Restorationist impulse pushed European Reform movements to be consistent in their application of sola scriptura especially in matters of ecclesiology. Evangelical renewal gave a finer point to several aspects of reformational identity and mobilized believers for Christian mission with a greater sense of urgency. All of these layers of identity are part of our Southern Baptist DNA, and they should be owned as such. But I would also suggest that there is a theologic to my ordering of the layers. Our Catholicity is what makes us Christian. While our reformational emphases offer needed clarification to our beliefs about the nature of the gospel and the scriptures, our restorationism represents a consistent application of those scriptures, and especially the New Testament, as well as that gospel to our life together in local churches. Our evangelicalism motivates us to go into the world for the sake of the salvation of sinners and the promotion of human flourishing. Rather than an exposition of Baptist distinctives, this lecture has been an exercise in prolegomenon, the foundational commitments upon which we should construct the future of Southern Baptist identity. I sincerely believe that the thoughtful, consistent, and intentional application of this paradigm will contribute to the ongoing renewal of Southern Baptist theology, the spiritual formation of Baptist Christians, the faith and practice of local Baptist churches, and our gospel witness to this world that God so loves and for which Christ died. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Finn. And now a blessing as we go. Bow with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for the life that we have by your Spirit that binds us together for mission in your world. God, would you go with us from this place, strengthen our hands for the work that you've called us to do. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. You are dismissed.